is the X-linked form of um, hyper-IgM. So I realized that when um, I sent the slides, I don't have a disclosure slide, um, but I do not have any disclosures. And these are the um, aspects that um, Kathy had uh, asked, me, asked me to touch upon. Um, and first, I'm going to give you a little bit of a definition um, and a historical perspective, because I think understanding where we were and where we are today is very important. I'll go over some clinical aspects of um, uh, the condition called X-linked hyper IgM. And then we'll talk about uh, living with um, this condition. Um, what are, are the treatments uh, that are available? What is the preventive care that's important? And I'll show you some data on um, transplantation and give you some uh, very brief updates on um, gene therapies because you're gonna have some wonderful speakers, uh, Dr. Malik and um, Dr. Donkon at the very end um, and um, really um, they, they are the experts in the field. Um, I'm going to briefly touch upon carriers and the importance of um, understanding this um, and, um, and the plans moving forward. And then I'm going to close with um, a topic that's also dear to my heart um, that, uh, that we're currently studying um, uh, uh, in, in patients uh, with hyper-IgM. So just to um, put things in a little bit of a perspective, um, hyper-IgM simply means that you have very high levels of an antibody called the IgM antibody in circulation. In general, if you have an inherited condition that is associated with an elevated IgM in circulation, this is generally associated with low or absent levels of um, other um, circulating antibodies, specifically as shown in the slide, IgG, IgA, and VIgE. So there are many forms of hyper-IgM. There are the congenital forms, and there's a many, many different genes that have been associated with elevated levels of IgA. And the first four that are noted there, CD40LG, CD40, AID, and UNG, these are genes that are classified as the classic forms of hyper-IgM. The other form of having very, the other reason one can have very high levels of IgM in circulation um, are the acquired defects. And this is when you have certain types of infections that can cause very high levels, certain conditions like uh, multiple myeloma, uh, conditions like um, chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemias, certain lymphomas, certain autoimmune diseases. But the condition that we are going to focus on today and that I'm going to um, uh, uh, really delve in is uh, the condition that is associated with a defect in a gene called the CD40 ligand gene. And it's, it's stand, and the way you find that gene uh, if you're Googling it, it's uh, CD40LG. So um, unfortunately, the slide doesn't, um, it sort of looks odd in your, um, on your screen because some of the dates are sort of not looking very well, but, um, and I apologize for that. Uh, it doesn't look like this in my screen. But we, this is a journey, and it's been 55 years, if you look at the timeline here, between the first descriptions that were in 1961, um, when Fred Rosen from, um, at the Children's Hospital in Boston and the group in France by Burton um, published the first cases of, um, of, of children, of boys with uh, what appeared to be an X form, uh, meaning inherited um, through uh, uh, affected boys and females being carriers. <coughs> and, <clears throat> and that um, it had to do with these very high levels of um, antibodies um, called IgM antibodies. And for, um, for the next um, two, 20 years or so, the focus in terms of understanding this was mainly looking at the B cells 
and looking at, you know, the B cells, because we know B cells make antibodies, looking at the B cells to see what was about the B cells that just wasn't able to switch and make the specific IgG antibodies. And it wasn't until 1985 when Mayer was working in Henry Kunkel's lab um, at the Rockefeller that um, he was looking at, he was taking B cells from patients that had this hyper IgM um, syndrome um, and he mixed them with um, a cell line called the accessory cell line, which is a tumor line. And all of a sudden, these B cells started making IgG. And so what that taught us and what that explained was that, um, yes, maybe the B cells had a problem, but it needed the help of the, these T cells that um, formed part of the cell line of tumor cells. These T cells was t were telling these B cells what to do. So there was an interaction there. And so that was in 1985. And so um, by the uh, early 19, uh, 1990s, um, we knew that the disease was um, X-linked and we started to know where in the X chromosome um, the disease was noted. And in 1993, wonderful thing happened in that three groups um, published the, the, the genetic defect for this condition called X-linked hyper IgM. And this and the gene was first called GP39, but um, it's now termed the CD40 ligand gene. And this is when the discovery of the gene occurred. And, and amongst the, the groups were both from the US and Europe. And amongst the group um, in the US, one of our um, colleagues, Dr. Ox, who's giving a talk currently on was got all was an important participant. And really the group in Seattle um, and, and subsequently with uh, Troy Turgeson, really have been key um, describers of this condition. And so, um, so once the disease was discovered, the gene was discovered, um, you know, the first, the first transplant occurred in 1995. And it was a, fat, it was a, a successful transplant um, that was done um, by the group in, in France. And then it trickled along and, and you started seeing case reports and then small series. Um, and today, um, the, the, the current available cure for this condition is um, bone marrow transplantation or hematopoietic cell transplant. So by the end of the 90s, um, we, we knew the gene. And so we thought, well, obviously, if we know the gene, can we just go ahead and just fix that gene and um, th these were the early days of gene therapy. And so the first studies in uh, animal models came out and um, there was a little bit of a setback because what that told us is that you can't just get the CD40 ligand into the T cells and keep them on there forever because if that is always the case, um, then you could develop lymphomas and that's what these uh, animals develop. And so the question, what we learned from this, from these animal studies, was that the CD40 ligand is not on the surface of T cells all the time. It just comes up whenever it's needed. And so, um, so then, in, and that was a work that occurred in the, in the early 2000s. And then finally, in 2016, um, the group at, at Seattle, led by David Rollins and, and Troy Turgeson, um, uh, published the first reports where they could fix the CD40 ligand gene in a regulated manner um, in, in animal models. And then my dear friend, uh, Carolyn Kuo um, at, uh, at UCLA um, demonstrated uh, for the first time in, in 2018 that she could, that she could uh, do that in these mother cells and hematopoietic stem cells that we um, talked about um, uh, that I'll talk about in a minute, a little later. So um, this just, just shows you that the CD40 ligand gene encodes for a protein, and this protein is called the CD40 ligand, or CD40L, um, that's on the surface of these of the CD4 positive T cells, and that's going to talk to the B cells, and then this B cell is going to um, switch from making this IgM antibody to making the G. A and E. So um, this, 
why do you care? Why do you need, if you already have IgM, why do you need to get these other ones? Well, IgM is a great antibody as a first line of defense, but it's really not sufficient to clear infectious organisms. And the other but antibodies are much more specific and capable of engaging the different components of a microbe um, or germ to be able to clear it. The other thing that happens is when the T cells talk to the B cells, and these B cells now make these IgG, A, or E antibodies, is that this B cells then stays with us and it remembers what it's seeing, and it's called the memory switch, memory B cells. And because this memory B cells has been able to switch from IgM to IgG, it's called the switched memory B cell. And so this is why defects in the CD40 ligand or the, the molecule on, CD, on, the, on the B cell called CD40 are called defects in isotype switch recombination, meaning isotype meaning types of different antibodies. So this is a cartoon of the CD40 ligand gene. And what you can see is that um, they, there are reports of uh, defects in this gene that, are, that occur in all the different parts of the, of the molecule. Um, and while the, there are reports, and, and what you can see here is that the, the white box here is where the, the part of the molecule of the protein that is inside the cell this section here is what it's uh, anchored onto the membrane. And this whole part here is what comes out, sticks out of the cell. And that, and th this is the, what is called the extracellular uh, domain. And what you can see is that you, you have mutations all along here. Now, there are reports that, that there may be what we call milder phenotypes, meaning that the manifestations of the disease are maybe not very severe. But for, for the most part, you can't really predict um, that a person is going to have uh, a specific type of uh, clinical manifestations, whether they have the mutation in one part of the molecule or another part of the molecule. Um, and that's very important. So in terms of the clinical aspects, um, and here is estimated prevalence. And the estimated prevalence is thought maybe one in a million. Personally, I think it's much, much more frequent than we anticipate. Um, and, that, um, and the reality is we don't really know. Um, and and the, a big lesson we've learned from, um, from newborn screening uh, with um, uh, uh, severe combined immune deficiency or SCID is that um, that we used to think that maybe one in a hundred thousand kiddos that 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 was that were born had skid, and now we know that it's maybe one in forty to may, maybe one in sixty thousand. So the reality is that this is what you'll see published, and you will read the prevalence of hyper X-linked hyper IgM being one in a million. But I think it's it's a less much more common. The inheritance is X-linked. And the gene, and we talked about, um, is the CD40 ligand gene. And how, what are types of clinical manifestations? Well, I told that you need antibodies to clear uh, microbes, and so 80% will present with bacterial infections. But um, the molecule that is present on, this, on, the, uh, on these uh, T cells when they become activated also talk to other cells called macrophages and so it is important to clear um, uh, these uh, different microbes, including opportunistic infections um, by T cells talking to other cells. And so these opportunistic infections include pneumocystis girovecchi, um, and that can cause pneumonia. And in about 40% of, uh, of patients, you will this will be their first presenting um, sign. And I'm talk, I'll talk about pneumocystin in a minute. The other common manifestation is um, about 50% will have some intermittent neutropenia, meaning um, neutrophil counts or a certain type of white cells called neutrophils are decreased. And that can cause oral ulcers, can cause um, um, infections as well diarrhea and failure to thrive, and an infection by another uh, opportunistic organism called cryptosporidium 
um, can cause significant disease and um, is thought to be an important contributor, but probably not the only contributor to the liver disease and, 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 and complications of um, liver uh, disease called sclerosing cholangitis. And in about 5%, um, you will see uh, the development of malignancies. Um, and what is unique uh, is these uh, rare neuroendocrine um, small slow growing tumors um, that uh, we see in patients um, with the X-linked form. And why that is, is not very well understood. Well, not very well, it's not understood. So if you look at, um, if you look at laboratory testing, um, it, it, what you'll see is that the IgG and IgA are low, the M is elevated, but sometimes the M may be completely normal. So the younger the child, um, the more normal the looking IgM. Vaccine titers will be absent. In other words, um, you do need to, when you're, when, you, when you're giving vaccine, you're trying to make IgG antibodies and make um, these memory B cells remember it. <clears throat> and so, um, because you need that T cell help and that communication to occur and that crosstalk to occur, um, the vaccine titers are gonna be absent. However, if you just measure the T cells and B cells and the natural killer cells um, in the blood, they're all going to be in normal numbers. How do you make the diagnosis? Well, you have to take the, t the cells, the T cells, put them in a test tube, make them, stimulate them, and show that the CD40 ligand come, can come up and get expressed on the surface of that T cell. And you know, when that happens, it just, the, the, the CD40 ligand gets expressed, it lasts for you know, five to 10 minutes and then it disappears. So it could be possible that, um, that you know, depending on the conditions of how cells travel, et cetera, that you may have abnormalities um, in, in some of these testing that you know, then turn out normal. Um, and so these are called um, bioassays where you take live cells and you, you, you stimulate them. So sometimes they can be tricky. And so you really need to make sure that these tests are done in laboratories that are doing this on a regular basis. And obviously the gold standard is confirming um, genetic, um, genetic variant. So how are we doing? Um, um, the reality is that if you, once the diagnosis is made, um, you, the, the long-term outcomes um, are, are still suboptimal. Now, I told you that in the, when the disease was described, the first groups of patients that were um, um, described in, in series uh, was in the late 1990s. And at that time, um, what you could see is that about only 40, uh, between 20 and 40% of people were um, surviving past their mid-20s. However, now we are much better, um, but still um, not um, optimal. So there's uh, room for improvement and we need to do better. So the next slide of slide is, um, we're gonna talk about um, two of the, the pathogens, these opportunistic infections. And I've shown these slides in the past, but I think they're very important. And I want you to understand um, how they are treated and what we, know, what we know how to prevent them. And one of them is this pneumocystis gyrovecchi. And that, I told you, can cause pneumonia. You can see a picture here. And um, these are these round little sort of um, brown um, little, um, um, uh, little, they're considered little fungi. And all of us get exposed to pneumocystis because it's in the air, right? And most of us will get exposed before the age of one. Um, but many of us, by the age of less than five, we're going to be exposed to it. And so it, the reason, because most of us are going to be um, seeing this before the age of one, that is when it's most commonly seen. And in about 40% of patients, they come to medical attention with pneumocystis pneumonia um, um, occurring between three months and a year. And, um, but the good news about pneumocystis is that there is a treatment, um, and that is the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. 
And the good news is that you can prevent it. So once the diagnosis is established of X-linked type or IgM, you can prevent this um, disease. Now, when to continue, when to use this prevention and this prophylaxis, do you keep doing this for the rest of your life or do you do it for the first years of your life? Um, there is debate about that and I'll, talk, I'll show you some information and some data that was compiled. Um, there isn't cons a consistent standard in how we're gonna uh, address this um, because some people will say, um, and one of them, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ox, and, and especially his uh, uh, older adult patients um, who may be doing well are not necessarily um, taking in the uh, um, bathroom. So there's a lot of debate amongst the medical field. The next slide is about cryptosporidium. And this is this tiny little parasite that you see here. And you may have heard it. This is what people we call a crypto and it's associated with a diarrheal type uh, illness. And, um, and you get them and you may have heard in the summer that certain water parks, there are outbreak of cryptosporidiums in, in, in water parks. Um, and so, so the reality is that um, you can see it anywhere, anywhere in the United States and throughout the world. Um, the good news is that there's treatment for cryptosporidium these days. Um, and and um, there is medication. Um, and how do you get it? Again, so obviously if you are swallowing water from, um, you know, swimming pools or lakes or rivers, um, that's why we, I, I usually um, ask our patients not to go to public pools and not to go to um, lakes and rivers um, that may be contaminated. Now, it's not the same in adult, um, that can keep their mouth shut and not have things um, come in their mouth versus a child. So, so there, are, there are things that one can do. Um, importantly, the, I really want to focus on the importance of washing your hands with soap and water, and you've heard a lot about that. Um, but this is particularly important for cryptosporidium because alcohol-based hand sanitizers are not effective against cryptosporidium. So you really need to wash your hands with uh, soap and water, and you need to sing two happy birthdays when you wash your hands with soap and water. That's the time it really takes um, to get a good uh, wash. And then, you know, wash linens and clothing that may have been soiled um, with hot water as well. So I told you that, um, what about treatments? And this is, um, again, uh, the, um, the uh, um, what, what we had collected um, a group of 176 patients from all over the world, and we asked the physicians taking care of patients with hyper IgM, uh, X linked hyper IgM, how did you treat your patients? Um, and so, what you can see is that there's a consensus in that 95% of uh, individuals were being treated with gamma globulin infusions. Um, and that's very important because we know that patients with the X-linked hyper IgM cannot make IgG. So it's critical that you um, give gamma globulin. What about the pneumocystis? Well, I told you that there's a little bit of debate here and when to use it and for how long to use it. And what you can see is that about 75% of individuals were starting it at the time of uh, of diagnosis, but in about 25% of cases, they were not. What about, um, is there anything out there to prevent cryptosporidium? And the reality is that it, there isn't. Um, um, and so there is some information, which is very, probably not very uh, robust um, in the HIV uh, world, where we know that when um, patients are, have very low T cells, they are, very, they are also susceptible to, um, uh, can be susceptible to micro, uh, cryptosporidiums. And there's some, um, some very um, soft data that suggests that maybe azithromycin might be helpful. And so, um, but what you can see here is that 92% of the uh, physicians that treat patients really do not use azithromycin prophylaxis. 
What about the neutropenia? We know that the neutropenia can cause, um, you know, oral ulcers um, and can cause infections. Um, and so the question is, um, do you use um, growth factor called um, GCSF to treat that neutropenia? And do you use it for the rest of your life or not? And the reality is we really don't understand why some patients with um, X-linked hyper IgM could get neutropenia. But no, look here, there's really not a lot of difference in terms of, um, you know, uh, some, about half and half of the uh, physicians will, will recommend um, GCSF. Importantly, if you look at um, doctors all over the world, it doesn't matter where they're, whether you're in North America, in Australia, or um, Asia, Middle East, what you can see is that there's really not a big difference in terms of practices um, for these um, four fundamental uh, questions of uh, prevention. However, if you look at those patients that, uh, how many patients get um, transplanted, you will see that uh, amongst these 176 patients, 67 or about 40% of them got transplanted and 60% of them did not. And yet there was a difference in terms of where you lived, whether you um, underwent transplant or not. And this is what this slide shows you. So if you live in South America, um, there is a 20% chance that you um, uh, are transplanted. If you live in North America, anywhere between, um, and this means um, uh, Canada and the US uh, does not include um, uh, Mexico, about, it's, a, it's a, about 60, 40%, uh, percent, so 40% are being transplanted. In Europe, however, it's much more of a 50-50 with the trend uh, towards transplantation um, more frequently. And in the Middle East and Australia, there weren't in this group of patients, there weren't any patients that had been transplanted. But notice that the numbers are much, much smaller. So, you know, this is the tyranny of small numbers. So you don't really, you, you know, you, you have to take it with what, for what it is. So <clears throat> I, I put all of these words up here, um, hematopoietic uh, HCT or hematopoietic cell transplant, HSCT, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, bone marrow transplant, and the use of PBMCs or peripheral blood mononuclear cells um, to transplant. And so this is, the, this is what we want to achieve. In the bone marrow, um, where all the cells of the body are going to come from, um, there are these multipotent um, hematopoietic stem cells, and these are the mother cells, if you will. They live in the bone marrow, and they're quiet, and they're in a, in a state where um, whenever they are needed, um, they, will they will progress, and they will progress to form the cells of the blood. And so and remember, in the blood, there's three types of cells. There's the red cells that carry oxygen, then there's the platelets that clot blood, and then there's the whole bunch of different white cells. And within the white cells, there's the, you know, the ones that we know the most are the neutrophils that are sort of the first line of defense that come and eat up the bacteria. And then there's the lymphocytes. And within the lymphocytes, there are the B cells that make antibodies, the T cells, they're called T because they're born in the bone, in the thymus, and then the natural killer cells. And it is in these T cells, these, these T cells are the ones where the defect is, okay? And these T cells are the ones that talk to the B cells to make these antibodies. So the goal is um, to, to um, you for have to make room in the bone marrow and um, provide enough of these multipotent hematopoietic stem cells to give rise to all of them. And that's the only way to um, give rise to constantly rise to these cells because you would say, oh, why don't we just give T cells? The problem is that these are, um, these have, uh, uh, you know, a short span. They're not gonna be there forever. The problem with transplantation is that you have to have a matched sibling, right? And so if you have a sibling, the chances that that sibling 
is, um, is a match is just one in four. And so if you look at um, matched sibling donors, only about 10 to 15% of the population are gonna have matched sibling donors. The, the, the next question is, um, you know, can you find a matched unrelated donor? And, and that depends on your ethnicity. And yes, about only 60% of European descent will have matched sibling donors, but you know, 40% of people may not have matched sibling donors. The other limitation of transplant is that, you know, I showed you that um, in the bone marrows, there's tons of cells and you can have other, other you know, you have T cells um, and you have other cells and these host cells, even the patient is capable of rejecting this rat, this graft that you're trying to put in. But more importantly, the donor can cause harm to the host by a, a disease called graft versus host disease. And finally, if you have infection or end organ damage, it certainly can impact survival. So I showed you the previous, um, you know, uh, long-term survival in, in overall, but if you look at survival in, in our cohort of 67 patients with X-linked type or IgM, that we followed here retrospectively for almost 20, 12 years, over 80% survival past 10 years was noted. So this is very important. Um, and, and, and this, you know, just shows you that, um, that transplantation certainly can be a cure. So when do you go to transplant? So we showed that um, if, if you, you know, there's not a lot of difference before age one and before age two. But when you start seeing a difference is past age five here, you start seeing that these lines, this is, these are again survival curves. This is a survival probability and this is time since transplantation. You start seeing a separation here. And then if you are transplanted after age 10, there is a significant difference. Now, you have to be careful because this is based on past experience. Right, and so um, there, there we have advanced in transplantation pra practices. And the reason this disease is is dear to my heart is because one of my um, patients' mom came to me when she was pregnant, and she, um, you know, um, she and her husband were completely different ethnic backgrounds, and um, the little boy was affected. And she wanted to have, and, and he didn't have a match, and she wanted to know, um, you know, what is the long-term survival in terms of, um, you know, comparing transplant versus no transplant. And patients really ask the fundamental questions, and that is what, what got me on the quest of this disease. And so, um, and so we, we looked at that, and we looked at uh, comparing patients that had been transplanted versus no transplant. And the long-term survival, the probability of survival really had not, it was no different. And that's a very important concept. Um, having said that, it is important to understand that, um, you know, there are flaws when you're just looking backwards and you're not looking forward and you're not trying looking at um, data that is much more uh, modern. And what you can see here is that the difference in survival um, if you are transplanted after uh, 2005 versus before 2005, with almost 90% survival um, in the, in, uh, after the 2005. But the liver disease is critical and understanding the liver disease and understanding where you are in terms of um, uh, how healthy your liver is, not only going to transplant and not only, but if you don't go to transplant, this is an important predictor of um, mortality. So attention to the liver, attention to um, how to prevent uh, liver disease is critical. And more recently, um, in the last year, the group uh, from uh, Newcastle um, spearheaded uh, uh, a, a European and North America um, retrospective study again, 
this time um, um, with many more patients, 130 patients as compared to the 67 patients that we had talked about before. And what, you, and what they showed was the, similar to what we had reported is that the best outcomes were if you're transplanting patients after the year 2000 and less than 10 years of age. And importantly, and what they showed is that myeloablative conditioning and what that means is you really need to make space in that marrow. You need to get rid of all the cells that are there um, to, 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 to be able to get a graft in. And, um, and, and, and that was associated with best outcome. But we're not, we're not out of the woods. There was graft rejection reported in 15% of patients. At five years after transplant, a third of patients were requiring IgG. Uh, replacement. And um, graft first as host was reported in about 45% of patients. Um, most of the time, um, very easily well managed and easily managed, but about 4% they were um, chronic GVH occurred. Um, and I just want to point again, uh, I sound like a broken record, but cryptosporidium is very important. And you can see here that whether you have it or not, it's really impact survival. Um, and so this is um, even in the, even in the um, even in the uh, um, uh, at, in the in the last ten years in the two thousand era. Okay, so cryptosporidium attention to cryptosporidium is very important. So. Um, so what about gene therapy? And this is a slide that um, I took from my dear friend, uh, Carolyn Kuo. Um, and so we, we know that for many, from, you know, once we found the gene, um, we can just fix it, right? And we can fix it. And the important thing is that in order to get it to the, the T cells that we need and that these, and, 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 and produce more T cells as the, the older T cells are dying out, you need to get this gene inside of the um, of these hematopoietic uh, multipotent stem cells, these quiet cells. And that is a difficult uh, endeavor. It's not easy to do, um, but that is critical part of where we are today in terms of gene therapy. And so the history of gene therapy just didn't happen overnight, and it really is over the past 60 years in the making. And um, the last couple of decades have really seen an incredible advancement. And so I'm not gonna talk about details because you have the two wonderful speakers, Dr. Malik and Dr. Khan. Um, but basically I just wanted to, to, you know, the concept is very simple, right? And simple things are usually the details, the devil is in the details. But basically what you wanna do is take that gene and be able to deliver it into the cells that need them, right? And so to do that, you need a delivery system. And these delivery systems are called vectors. And the vectors allows um, the introduction of that genetic material into the nucleus of a cell. And so there are two types of vectors. There are the viral ve vectors, which you can see on the left uh, lower part of the screen. And then there are the non-viral vectors um, on the top part. And so why do we want to use viral vectors? Well, we, the viral vectors are critical because, um, because the viruses know how to use, viruses need cells to survive. And, and so they have the, a natural ability to enter a cell and incorporate itself into the genetic material of that cell. Obviously, we're not just going to give a virus. Um, we are going to um, change that virus so that all the bad parts of the virus um, and that can be harmful are removed. And basically, you're left with like a little package, a little delivery system here that has all the little keys and locks to enter the cell um, in, 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 uh, in, an e in, a, in a way that is effective. Now, um, there is novel technologies advances, advances uh, incredibly. And what you can see here is these non-viral um, vectors, which are particles 
that you can make the cells that can enter the cells as well. And, and that's just by physical um, entering, almost like a BB gun getting, this, getting it into it or changing the chemical structure that allows them to enter and pass the membrane and go in. So, um, so gene therapy can, can, has, has been used for many, many different conditions now. And, um, and so you can deliver these genes um, in vivo directly into the individual. Alternatively, and what, we, um, what the groups are doing today is that you're collecting those cells that you wanna correct, in particular, these hematopoietic stem cells, um, and, and, and in the test tube, um, uh, use the different vectors to m incorporate that genetic material and then bring it back. And so this is what um, is, is being you know, done now, and Dr. Khan will explain that. Um, the problem is um, that you really need these quiet hematopoietic stem cells. And so um, there are wonderful advances, and the group in Seattle led by um, uh, David Rawlings um, and, um, and Troy had been uh, an integral part of this, um, of this, um, um, these studies really have, um, were the first to, to demonstrate um, and publish the, how you can fix and, and incorporate that new gene um, and, and, and that new gene being regulated, right, um, to be turned on or off whenever it was needed um, in T cells. And then um, my friend Carolyn Kuo demonstrated that she can do that in these incredible and important um, hematopoietic stem cells. Now, the concept is easy, right? And, um, and you can do that in the test tube and, and things happen. Um, but the key is being able to get it into these quiet hematopoietic stem cells. And that is what is difficult because the, the, these, the, these stem cells, once you start the, um, ma uh, uh, targeting them, these stem cells, then when they're woken up from their sleep, if you will, they're now start, they become committed to moving forward. And so it's trying to catch them in their sleep um, that is uh, critical. So I'm changing gears. What about carriers? Um, and are they affected? And this is a critical and very important um, aspect. And Akiva um, and, and, and Troy Torgerson were really spearheading um, trying to um, uh, study this because we really need to understand how carriers are doing. For the most part, um, carriers are healthy. And so, um, and, and, and why are they healthy? Because you really don't need that functional, a, a normal functioning CD40 ligand for T cells to mature and survive. And um, I told you that the CD40 ligand gene is on the X chromosome and females have two Xs, right? And so when um, in, in the cells, you don't want double dose of a, of a gene, right? right? Because we, we get one X is from our mom and the other X is from our, our, our dad, right? And so um, that means that we always have two pairs of genes. And so if one of those genes is defective, um, the other one sort of compensates. Well, what happens in um, CD40 ligand, in, in carriers of CD40 ligand, is that um, the X chromosome um, in, in T cells, um, usually the, the one is randomly turned on or off, like in any other um, cell. So the T cells of, of, of carriers of CD40 ligand um, have um, you know, some T cells that don't express CD40 ligand and others that express it completely normal. And for the most part, they're, they're totally healthy. And what we've learned, and this is studies that were done by um, uh, Hans Ox many years ago, is that a little can go a long way. In other words, as low as between 10 and, and, and percent, if you have about 10 percent of those T cells being able to express CD40 ligand, you do pretty well. And the majority of, um, of, uh, of 
uh, carriers have anywhere between 30 to 60% of T cells expressing CD40 glycan normally. However, there are reports um, and um, uh, I've had experience of females having less than 10% and, um, and around 5% um, demonstrate clinical disease and a phenotype like CVID. So the point here is that understanding what's the minimal amount that you need is going to be critical as we advance um, these therapies, right? And so as we advance um, gene therapy, knowing that what's the amount of T cells that you need um, to, to, um, to, to get be corrected to um, be successful. So, um, and this is my last, last slide. And, I, and a shout out to, again, this is a topic dear to my heart. You know, as a physician, when you see a patient, you, you ask a lot of questions, right? And all of you have experienced this. Are you having fevers? Are you needing antibiotics? Have you had to go to the ER? Um, are, you, um, are you having any chest pain? Are you having, you know, infections, diarrhea? Um, did you go get the labs done? Did, you know, we're, we, we look for signs, we look for symptoms, we look for things to make sure that, you know, everything is working right and, every, and, 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 we, and we can control as much as possible, um, you know, the disease and you know, we do studies, et cetera. But we need to step back and we need to ask, do we really ask enough about how is it impacting your life? Are you... Are you limiting yourself from going to college at a different in place because you want to stay home closer to the, where you've had your care? Are you limiting your choices of careers? Are you, um, um, how is, how's having to get these infusions, are you, how is it really impacting your life? And these are very important critical questions, right? And it's about quality of life. And it's about, you know, we want to fix everything, but we need to take a step back and ask, you know, how is this impacting uh, the, the quality of life? And so in partnership with um, the Hyper IGM Foundation, I was able to, I, I wrote a proposal and was granted um, um, monies uh, to, to ask this particular question and to look at um, health-related quality of life. And so I put there the, the Hyper IGM Foundation, and I'm, you know, I, I really would encourage those of you who, who have excellent Hyper IGM to help us in this, because as we advance therapies, we need to understand this is a partnership. This is not just about us um, and, and you separately. We both need to go down this road together, and we need to understand you know, how, the, how, how this disease is impacting quality of life and how, you know, what are the, the risks um, that you're willing to um, take to, to move forward um, and to advance therapies. So um, with that, I'm going to stop here and I'm happy to take um, uh, questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jilla Marina. We have a few questions here. We've got about... Um, Five, twelve, seven minutes to oh. answer as many as possible. Sorry. So, and um, if you can see them, I think you can see them on the chat too. But oh, first gosh. question, how far out have you seen patients who have undergone stem cell transplant? And do you know of any long-term complications into adulthood? So um, the, the, the data that we collected, we have patients um, that, had, um, that were out uh, 20 years um, after, tra after transplantation in that series. Um, the longest uh, patients that I've seen um, are now um, 10 years out um, and doing very well. Um, so um, we have not, you know, that these are the the, the majority of the complications and, you know, the mortality of, uh, of transplantation is usually occurring at the beginning. Um, after that, we're not seeing it. Now, one of the biggest problems after transplant, and 
you saw that in the um, in the more recent paper is that you know what's the immunologic reconstitution and how many T cells do you have that um, can still make um, that is enough to keep uh, people um, healthy, right? And so that we've learned from carriers that about 10 uh, to 12% um, an, of T cells um, might be enough. And so you can see that progressive drop in the, in the engraftment of, of the different cells of the, you know, over time. But, you know, the critical question is, and, and monitoring is important, is how, 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 what percent of these T cells are, are, are still capable of producing, you know, of upregulating the molecule. So long-term complications I, I've not seen, early transplant complications, yes. Um, next part of this question, have you seen an increased risk of transmission among families um, after my son's diagnosis in my extended family, six out of seven females um, were born to carriers. I'm sorry, uh, let me, I was, I was trying to find the page. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I was trying to look for It says, that. have you seen an increased risk of transmission among families? Um, after my son's diagnosis in my extended family, six out of seven females born, and I'm not sure if it's our carriers or it says two carriers. Yeah, so, um, so, so, so the, if, whenever you have an X-linked disease, um, what that means is that um, females are going to be um, carriers, and um, for every boy, there's a 50-50 chance that he will have a disease. And that's a random 50-50 chance. And for every girl that is born of a carrier, there's a 50-50 chance that they're going to be a carrier, right? <clears throat> so, um, so, you know, when you see large pedigrees of, of of the individuals and families, um, you know, one of the critical things that is very important, and I don't think we as physicians do a very good job at, is family history. And really making sure that once the diagnosis is made, that you explain that diagnosis to potential uh, uh, family members that may be affected. And that way, so that you can, you know, the the boys that may be born um, can be evaluated quickly um, and, um, and diagnosed quickly. So it's not like over time there's more and more chance. Each time the chance is the same. Just, I'm not sure if that answered the question. Thank you, next question. We are currently locked down for COVID. What is your opinion on this for an adult with hyper IgM, non-transplanted, also, does um, subcutaneous Ig therapy provide any coverage for new diseases such as COVID? And do the antibodies in Ig therapy have some ability to adapt to a new disease? Yes, yeah, so that's a you know, that's a fundamental and critical question, right? In an era of COVID, um, so I am not, so two two things. I'm, uh, the reality is that um, that each each we don't know, um, you know, how it's going to affect uh, patients uh, with X-linked hyper IgM. At least I have not seen um, publications with uh, or anecdotal experience of patients with X-linked hyper IgM um, getting COVID. I have had experience with uh, patients with antibody deficiencies who um, have had a COVID and have done um, uh, have done well. Um, there are others that have um, not been able to handle the disease be, and, and thought to be related to um, the underlying conditions. When uh, between the time you, you make, you isolate plasma from an individual um, and combine it with um, 10 to, to 1,000 donors to make the IgG product that comes 
um, at your door, that time frame can be anywhere between 12 and 18 months, right? And so the reality is that, you know, our, our patients with, um, with uh, who are on IgG therapy, are they protected against COVID? And the answer is that the, today, they, they are not. Now, we do know that there are lots of antibodies against other coronaviruses, and whether those um, may contribute or help, um, I, it, we don't know. But, but can, does it prevent them from getting COVID? No. Now, two years from now, when the, if the population is different and, it, and you are having more antibodies, in, 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 you know, in IgG preparations. Could those be protective in the future? Um, we don't know that yet, um, but that is a possibility. What about you know, isolation um, and what to do? And so the reality is, um, you know, I think it, it, it's very um, dependent on understanding what is the prevalence in your community, right? Um, what are the means that people take around you? Um, are they usually masks? Are they really being respectful? Um, and what are the chances of transmissibility, right? Um, and, and how comfortable are you with being able to interact? And there's not a right or wrong answer. And I try to, you know, uh, work with families to make sure that, you know, we all are comfortable with with that, those isolation practices and really following, you know, we know that masks and hand washing and, and distancing are important. And so today that's what we have and, and that's what I would encourage and I would recommend, you know, following what is the prevalence in your community with the DOH and what is the, you know, what is happening at the, at the national level uh, through the CDC. That's a long answer to a very, specific it's question. A, it's a great answer. And now we have run out of time. And if your question wasn't answered, um, uh, we will take a look at them and forward them to Dr. Della Morena and follow up with you with our reply. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Della Morena. And I just, uh, just that my email is down there. So I'm happy to you know, answer questions. Oh, well, there we uh, go. Yeah. You can send your question directly <laughs> to her. Wonderful. Thank you. All okay. Right. Next Take session care. is at 2.30 and it is with Dr. Malik. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.